or after the death. The Torah portion today comes to us from Leviticus chapter 16 through 18. The Torah portion of Akre begins with God detailing to Moses how Aaron should make an atonement for himself and all of Israel on Yom Kippur. He describes the attire that Aaron should wear as well as the sacrifices that are to be brought to his altar. We then read about the sanctity of the blood and how it is the life source of the flesh. Also, God details how he has given the blood upon the altar as an atonement for our souls. The portion of Akre ends with God detailing to Moses the commands concerning abstaining from sexual immorality. The Haftarah portion comes to us from Amos chapter 9. Haftarah for this week is a call from God through Amos, questioning the sinful nature of his people. He proclaims that due to this sinfulness, we will, he will shake the house of Israel and that all the sinners among his people shall die by the sword. Furthermore, God proclaims that he will raise up the booth, of da- the booth of David that has fallen and restore the breaches and ruins. He will return them to the days of old, all of those who are called by his name. The after ends with God stating, I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. The Brit Kalasha portion comes to us from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. In the days of his flesh, Yeshua offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest, after the order of Melchizedek. This week's parasha focused on the role of the high priest and their importance in an offering up sacrifices to God for the atonement of sins. Likewise, Yeshua came to fulfill this role once and for all to put an end to death. Let us not take for granted what our Mashiach has done and continues to do for us. Even though he has called us friends, let us come before him, before his throne with fear and reverence, thanking him for rescuing us out of the grasp of the enemy. And finally, as we've been doing uh, last several weeks, uh, the Shabbat Tehillim portion is Psalm 26. Uh, The Tehillim portion for this week focuses on David asking God to examine his actions, to protect him and provide mercy and redemption. As we see in Psalm 26, verses 1 through 3 and 11 through 12, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be be merciful to me. My foot stands in even place. In the congregations, I will bless the Lord. May we live this psalm out in our daily lives, and may we thank Yeshua for the redemption he has and will provide us. Amen. Shofarim. sacrifice. You were the sacrifice for all the world, Lord, and we thank you, Father. We thank you for your nail-scarred hands, for your nail feet, Lord God, for the crown of thorns that you pl- that was placed upon your head, Father, for this world, Lord. How you took on the sins of all the world, Lord. We love you so much. Thank you, Father. Father, I pray this morning you would examine our hearts, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that we would ask you to forgive us of anything, Lord, that would be an offense to you, Lord. Father, we come to you today, Lord God, because we want to worship and praise you. We want to give you honor and glory. We want to thank you for everything that you have done for us, Lord God. 
We want to thank you especially for your word, Lord God, that became flesh. And we praise you today, Lord. We praise you. Father, as we sing praises unto you, Lord, let it come deep from our hearts, Lord God. We want to give you honor and praise. Lord, I ask for an anointing upon the word that is, as it comes forth this morning, Lord, that you would touch every heart here. And those that aren't with us today, Lord, I ask that you would touch them. Father, if there's anyone here today, Lord God, that needs a special touch from you, Lord, that is sick, that needs a healing, I pray, Lord God, that you would touch and heal. For anybody that's not with us, Lord, today, that's home and sick, Lord, I pray, Father, for your healing balm of Gilead to touch them and to flow over them from the top of their heads to the tip of their toes. Praise you today, Lord God. We praise you. Let your anointing flow in this place this morning. In the name of Yeshua, we give you honor and praise. Amen. Amen, amen. Let us stand together. For how lovely the tents of Jacob and the dwelling places of Israel. Shafted my impressive song, me money, I yes, you were. Shafted my impressive song, me money, I yes, you were. My, 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 oh, my impressive song, my, 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 oh, my impressive song. Hey, hey, oh, my, 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 my impressive song, my, my. Oh, my, my, best of some, shaft in my, best of some, me, my, they, I, yes, you were, shaft in my, best of some, me, my, they, I, yes, you were, my, 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 oh, my, best of some, my, 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 oh, my, best of some, hey, hey. Oh my, 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 best of some, my, 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 best of some. Therefore, with joy, we shall draw water from the wells of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We begin the Sadur with the Baruch Hu. Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvorak. Baruch Adonai Hamvorak Le'olam Va'en. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. V'shamru v'nei Yisrael. The children of Israel should keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. The blessing of the Mashiach together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu ederek hayeshua b'mashiach yeshua. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Please stand for the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch 
Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Ve'ahavta. Ve'ahavta et Adonai olhecha. V'chol lavavcha v'chol nafshecha v'chol moldecha. V'hayu havrim ha'elem. A'asher onaki metzavka ha'yom avla v'vekam. V'ashinan tam levenaka v'debart bam. V'ashivta k'bevetecha. Uva lektak va derek, ushak vakov kumakum, Uktar tam leota deka, vahayu, le toto bainanakum, Uktav tam zot betakum, uvishrakum. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words shall I command you this day shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Ha'amida, blessed are you, Lord our God and God of our fathers. God of Abraham, God of Yitzchak, God of Yaakov, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God who bestows grace and creates all, and remembers the kindness of the fathers, and brings a redeemer to their children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, helper, savior, and shield, blessed are you, O Lord, shield of Abraham. You are eternally mighty, my Lord. The resurrector of the dead are you, abundantly able to save who sustains and lives with kindness, resurrected them with abundant mercy, supports the fallen, heals the sick, releases the confined, and maintains his faith to those who sleep in the dust. Who is like you, O master of mighty deeds, and who is comparable to you, O king, who causes death, and restores life, and makes salvation sprout? Eloheinu, ve'elohe avutenu, our God and God of our fathers, may you be ple pleased with our rest, Sanctify us in your commandments, and grant us our portion in your Torah. Satisfy, from your good, satisfy us from your goodness, and make us rejoice in your salvation. And purify, purify our hearts to serve you in truth, in love, and favor, O Lord our God. Grant us our holy Shabbat as heritage, and may Israel sanctify your name, rest therein. Baruch atah Adonai, Mekadesh Shabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the Shabbat holy. Kadish, magnified and sanctified, be his great name in the world which, which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of, of the whole house of Israel, even swiftly and soon, and all say, Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity, blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is he, though he be high above all blessings and songs, praises and consolations, which are uttered in the world, and all saying, Amen. May you make peace in his high places, make peace upon us and upon all Yisrael, and say, Amen. Yitkadov yitkadash melorobam. Bamandira Kirti, Vimik Makata, Bakai Konov, Yomekonov Kai, the Kobe Israel, Ba Glawis Manka Rivim Ru, Amen. Yeshmer Rabah, 
Mevarak Leolam O Me O Mayam. Yitzbarak Vistrapak Vitzpra Altramam. Vietna save it's a dar vita lay with the lao shmuka sh shame the kudashabrakhu, la elam kopragata, vishra the tushbakata, veneki mata da ram ba ma vimru. Amen. Oh, say shalom bim rama. Who yase shalom ale nu. Ve a ko yisrael. Vimru. Vimru. Amen. Oh, say shalom bim rama. Shalom Aleinu Ve'ako Yisrael Vimru Vimru Amen Yase Shalom Yase Shalom Shalom Aleinu Ve'ako Yisrael Say shalom, ya say shalom, shalom aleinu, v'yachu Yisrael. Ya say shalom, ya say shalom, shalom aleinu, v'yachu Yisrael. Ya say shalom, ya say shalom. Shalom Aleinu Yaakov Yisrael May he who makes peace in high places make peace for Israel and for all mankind and say Amen. I can't hear me. There we go. Hey, sometimes we need extra start practice. Let's get to go. Let's try this again. In the morning, in the evening, when I'm young and when I'm old, when I'm laughing, when I'm grieving, every season of the soul in the heaven. With the angels forever and a day on the earth now with creation all nations praise your name everything that everything that that everything that has breath praise the Lord that everything that everything that everything When I'm grieving every season of the soul in the heavens with the angels forever and a day on the earth now with creation, all nations sing your praise, everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord and everything that, everything that. Everything that has breath, praise the Lord, and everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, everything that, 
everything that everything that has breath praise the lord great is the lord god almighty Great is the Lord on high. The train of his robe fills the temple. And cry out, highest praise. Glory to the risen King. Glory to the Son. Lift up your heads, open the doors, let the King of glory come in and forever be our God. Lift up your heads, open the doors, let the King of glory come in and forever be our God. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. And holy is the Lord on high. Let all the earth bow before you and crown you.
Oh, God of endless mercy, God of unrelenting love, oh, rescue every daughter, bring us back the wayward sons, and by your spirit breathe upon them, show the world that you alone can save. Come alive, up out of the ashes, let us see the army rise. We go out to dry bones, come alive. So breathe the breath of God, breathe the breath of God, breathe the breath of God, now breathe. Breathe the breath of God, breathe the breath of God, breathe the breath of God, now breathe, breathe the breath of God, now breathe the breath of God, breathe on us. We call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. So we come into your chambers to dance at your feet, Lord. You are my Savior, and I'm at your mercy. All that has been in my life until now, it all. still holy, even when the darkness surrounds my life. Oh, sovereign, you are still sovereign, even when confusion has blinded my eyes. Lord, I don't deserve your kind of action. When my unbelief has kept me from your touch, I want my life to be a pure reflection of your love. And so I come into your chambers to dance at your feet, Lord. You are my Savior. Your mercy, all that has been in my life until now, it all belongs to you. So I come into your chambers to dance for you. You are my Savior, and I'm in your mercy.
Still hope, even when the darkness surrounds me, Lord. You're sovereign, you are still sovereign, even when confusion may blind my eyes. Hallelujah. Holy are you. Holy and righteous are you, O oh God. We just bless your name today, God. We lift up our highest praise unto you. When we say that we belong to you, God, we surrender our hearts and our minds. We surrender every part of us today, God, at your feet, Lord. We cast our crowns and we bow down and we just lift up your name. We acknowledge you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and we come to bless you. Father God, I ask that you would come and breathe upon your people today, Father. We're so desperate for you. We're so desperate for your living word. Come and breathe upon us today, O oh God, and do a new thing in us, O oh God. Let each person that stands before you today be changed and be refined by your word that's going to come forth. Thank you, God, for your precious word, Father God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your love and for your mercy and your grace that you pour out on us every day. Thank you for being a loving Father. Thank you for your goodness in our lives, Lord, in every season of our souls. We know that we are okay because you are with us. We just bless you today. We worship you, and we thank you for this Shabbat. And we ask, Father God, that you would come and breathe upon us. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> When the ark would travel, Moshe would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word from the Lord from Yerushalayim. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Yisrael. Ya'amod, Yoel, ben Abraham, la Torah. Baruch et Adonai Hamvorak, Baruch Adonai Hamvorak le'olam va'en. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher b'cha b'nu mikom, ha'amin v'natan lanu et ratom. Baruch atah Adonai notein ha-torah. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Yeladim. Those that are watching this on the internet or that may be visiting with us this morning, this is a time in which we invite Hayela Dean for the children of Rosh Hashanah up front, and we pray a blessing over them. But first, we say Boker Tov, Yela Dean. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh Lord, for these blessed children and the families that they represent. May they be blessed abundantly, as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Lord, I ask that a hedge of protection be around each and every one of them, keeping them away from sickness, keep, keeping them safe from the diseases that are around about us, keeping them healthy, Lord, keeping them away from harm's way, Lord, that's around us also, Lord, in these end days. Lord, I also ask that as they grow physically, Lord, that spiritually they would be drawn to you, Yeshua, realizing who you are, the Messiah, the one that has come, that gives us life everlasting. And we thank you for that, O oh Lord. Lord, also surround them with godly men and women who will assist them on their life's journey. For we ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen.
Vidber Adonai la Moshe, Akre Mot Shene Bene Ahoram, Bikirvatam Lifne Adonai, Vaimutu, Vaumer Adonai la Moshe, Diber El Ahoron, Ahicha, Vel Yavo, Bakol, Et El Hakodesh, Mi Bet La Parochet, El Pene Hakaporet, Asher, Al Ahoron, Bolo, Yamut, Kibe Enan, Erae Al Hakaporet, Bazot Yavo Ahoron, El Hakodesh Bafar Ben Bakar Vachatat Vail Leola. And the Lord spake unto Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aharon, when they offered before the Lord and died. Um, and the Lord said to Mos unto Moshe, Speak unto Aharon thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aharon come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Amen. The blessing after the Torah reading. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu et Torah imet v'chayei olam natah b'techenu Baruch atah Adonai notein haTorah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Lord, Giver of the Torah. V'zot haTorah. V'zot haTorah asher shem Moshe lifnei bnei Yisrael al pirnai biad Moshe. And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the command of the Lord from, through Moses' hand. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Torah scroll is the Word of God. Yeshua is the Word. John the Immerser said in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God's Word is written on lambskin. Yeshua is this Lamb. In John 12.32, Yeshua said, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The two wooden poles holding the Torah scroll are called Eitz Chaim, or Tree of Life. Yeshua was sacrificed on two wooden poles some 2,000 years ago for our sins. Amen. Eitz Chaim Him. Eitz Chaim He Lamezachim Ba. Latom Kera Mushar. Drakir Dakir No Am Vakol Na Tivata Shalom. Hashavenu Anai Lekam Veneshiva Kadesh Menu Kikidem. Is a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and happy are those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Cause us to return to you, Adonai, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Revelation 2, 7 reads, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To him overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeshua was, is, and shall ever be this word of the one living God that we look upon this day for our salvation. Amen. Amen. May be seated. Looks different in here. Yeah. I like it. So Shabbat Shalom. Achore Mut. After the death, this parasha talks about Nadav and Abihu. It's an interesting, uh, obviously we talk about this every year, and every year it has new meaning. If 
you put this parsha into context with the world today, it's about combining that which is of the world with that which is spiritual and coming into the presence of God in an unholy manner. We're going to talk a bit about that here today. But first I wanted to talk for a second about a, a show I watched. There was a show on Prime that you can go out and look, you can watch. It's about finding the real Mount Sinai. Um, Now, I've heard the story about this, you know, that the show kind of documents, but I never, I never saw it from the people who, who, who basically found it firsthand, and I thought it was just pretty amazing uh, to watch these guys go through their journey to find this real Mount Sinai. And, uh, you know, they, they always, you know, there's been debate forever about the traditional uh, path that the the Israelites took from Egypt into the wilderness and then through the wilderness obviously into uh, the promised land but um, you know the path that they they feel like is the most legitimate path is the path where it goes through the Sea of Reeds and there's a land bridge that naturally formed under the water there that um, in fact when they were out they, they, they got in boats, they went out in the water, and they're in the middle of the water, and they jumped out of their boat, and the water was only to their knees, um, right in the middle of the sea, uh, because of this land bridge that connects from one side of uh, the, the area to Saudi Arabia, um, which would be the traditional area of Midian. Um, so it was, it was pretty interesting to see these guys in the middle of the water standing with water up to their knees. Uh, and it makes sense that, you know, we all think that the water went up in the air and then, you know, they walked across. Um, but their argument is probably more like a natural kind of, you know, the water kind of subsided off and then opened up this land bridge that they could cross on and then, and then came back up. But it's just like God, and I believe this with my whole heart, that, you know, that land bridge had to have been created naturally by God. And God knew that they would have to go there. And God led them there. And so here, here we have this, you know, they're reading the scripture as they go through this, this documentary and they're reading through the scriptures and they're looking for the signs. So in the Bible, it's very explicit. What it says was there at the time and where they went. After they crossed the Red Sea, they went 30 kilometers. And as they went 30 kilometers, they came to the bitter waters. So they get in the car and, you know, they drive what they believe would be 30 kilometers and they, sure enough, they come to these springs. They reach down into these springs and they take a drink of this water and it was so bitter that they couldn't even put it to their mouths. And pretty an amazing, pretty amazing, just th th they think, hey, look, it's adding up that this seems like this could be the route because the story's kind of kind of uh, being fulfilled here. And then they leave the bitter waters and they say the next route, next path would be to come to the place of 70 palms and 12 springs as it discusses and they read it right out of the scripture and they say they come to this, they, they journey the same distance further and they come to this place in the middle of this desert with 70 palms and 12 springs. Still there, still existing. Then they're there and they're talking to some of the Bedouins and the Bedouins tell them that this is the path of, of Musa. They say Musa was here with his people, Moses. And they're just like mind blown, right? Their mind is blown. And they, they, you know, they feel like they're making history and, and in fact they are. I mean, I mean, this is a beautiful historic event that's occurring as they're walking the journey of the children of Israel, you know, starting at the, at the land bridge in the sea of reeds. So then they get to this place and they say, okay, well, we have to go to a place, so we have to go to the mountain. And then this, they come to this Bedouin area and the Bedouins say, well, Jabal Laws, Jabal Musa, Jabal Laws, 
Jabal Musa. The mountain of laws, the mountain of Moses, is over here. And the Bedouins who have historic understanding because they've been around for thousands of years and they have stories that they talk about and they go through they're they're just like mind blown and they're thinking oh my gosh i'm gonna f i'm gonna come to this place that is that is considered the mountain of moses jabal musa so they they journey to the area where they say it is there sure enough they find this mountain and this mountain is surrounded by f fencing and barbed wire and big enormous signs by the, the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia that says there is no entry, this is an archaeological site, you're not allowed to be here, get away, go, right? Which they make the point that, it makes sense to me too, the point that they make, they make the point that if all of a sudden you would make people to understand and realize that this is Har Sinai, that this is Mount Horeb, okay? What Christian isn't going to journey there? What Jew isn't going to journey there? In a Muslim country of Saudi Arabia, no one wants tourism by Christians and Jews, so they stop it. And no one talks about it, and it's silent, and no one knows. So here they are, they're like, there's guards, military guards all around it and posts. And they decide to sleep out at night. And one point I thought was interesting is they said they were going through water like crazy. They couldn't stop drinking. It was so hot. They were losing their, you know, you know they weren't even moving and they were thirsty. Well, were the children of Israel not also so thirsty? Where they cried out for water. And God had to give them water, water from a rock. And they find that too. So we'll talk about that in a second. But here, here they are. They go... They, they, they look up at this mountain, and the interesting thing about the mountain, all of the terrain, look at all the topography. Every mountain looks the same in the region, right? They all are very rocky and sandy looking. But this mountain is the same up until about two-thirds of the way up. It's pitch black on the top. Pitch black, like it was submerged in fire. The only mountain in the area that looks like it was submerged, like that the top of this mountain was submerged in, in fire. So they're thinking to themselves, well, God showed up on the top of this mountain in the form of fire. It said that he descended, and they read it right from the scriptures. As they're going through it, they're reading from the scriptures, they read it right from the scriptures, that he descended upon the top of that mountain in fire and flame. So here... Here they're, they're seeing this and they're just mind blown and they're like, well, things have to add up. There's got to be some things that add up for this to be Har Sinai. So we got to look for it. And they're excited and they're making history. And they go and they say, well, we're going to sleep out here at night. And in the middle of the night, we're going to break through the fence and we're going to go into the, we're going to go into this mountain. Well, they come to it, they come to it, they get in, they figure the things out. Well, they come to this place at the, at the foot of the mountain that looks like an enormous altar that was only, had to have been man-made. And it was big. I mean, it was really big around, and there had to have been thousands of men to pick these rocks to make this altar. And this altar, it looked very, very huge. And on the side of the, offer were, on the, side of the altar were, were drawn in it hieroglyphs, Egyptian hieroglyphs of a calf. Now, why would there be Egyptian hieroglyphs in this region of the world drawn on the side of this altar at the foot of this mountain? It must have been where the golden calf had sit. These hieroglyphs are super old. It's, they, they date them. They look at it. It's just absolutely amazing. They're like, this has to be the place. And they say, well, there's got to be something else. So they're looking around the mountain, and they find... Twelve smooth pillars laying about on the ground. And they read in the scriptures that Moses placed twelve pillars for the twelve tribes around the mountain. And here these are. 
And they weren't like any other rocks. They weren't like the rest of the rocks. These were, these were very specific, special pillars made of marble, round and circular. Pillars established made of marble. This wasn't normal or to this area. It wasn't, it wasn't normal to be there. Okay, so that makes that that adds a little bit more to the to the story, and then they they start looking at it, and they start seeing around the perimeter of the mountain. There's these like walls that were built around the perimeter, and they were all set evenly apart from each other, all the way around the mountain. And then they start reading where God commanded them to set a perimeter around the mountain so that the people wouldn't come in. And here they did; they set a wall, a perimeter, all around this mountain. And I'm looking at it on the show, and I'm seeing it, and I can't help but imagine that this had to have been the place of, 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 of the holy place of God. They, they've climbed the mountain. They get to the top of the mountain. They say, we're going to get to the top of that mountain. They get to the top of that mountain. It's black as coal. They pick up one of the rocks, and they, they say, well, we've got to see what's, what this is. So they, they pound this rock out and, to, and break it in half, and it's kind of like ashy. It's all ash ashy around it and then in the very center it's granite which suggests extreme heat so then they go down they find altars other areas around the mountain and you know the jewish people were the only people that made animal sacrifices they they were the only people that brought animal sacrifices and they find altars where they also find ash and they're like, wow, this has to be the place. So then they're like, well, if this is the place, then there's a place where there's a rock with a split in it because the place with the rock with the split in it is the place where the water came forth, where God told Moshe to strike the rock. So then they go traveling to look for that rock with the split in it, and there, just like the Bible says, is an enormous rock with a split in the middle of it that looks almost like a gateway. And all around that rock was other rock that formed and kind of came down and it went into an area with a big pit. And this area is all stone and rock. But for some reason, this area, which was around this rock with the split in it, all of the stone was smooth. Like it had been run over by water at extreme rates. And then there was an area that came and pulled out, like it filled with water. Imagine in that area, to, to have three million people drink water, there's going to have to be a lot of it. It can't just be a little spigot. Okay, we, we assume that water came from the rock, and we're, we're picturing like a little fountain that we have out in the foyer there, right? That, a little water that comes in, everybody comes up with their cup and gets a little bit. No, this was a lake. Strikes the water and <laughs> water comes rushing from this, this rock. And who knows, maybe the split in that rock is what directed the water, right? Like a hose. All of it came together in this thing. It's only about a 70 minute thing, but man, it was, it was moving to me because... Not that, I, not that we don't believe that any of it's true. I mean, we believe it. It's the Bible. It says it's true. It had to have happened. The, pro, the difference here is that the world has been misguided. Our focus has been here when it's here. We haven't seen the real, the reality of what God has done because we're making it up as we go. And that's historically what's gone on. Man makes up the story. They write it down, and then they decide this is what it is. This is the interpretation. Churches, congregations throughout all the, all the world live by decrees and, and letters that were written by men from 2,000 years ago on, from 6,000 years ago on. The Bible is a complete book of many books that give us direction to look for. When you begin to bring the influence of the world into your faith, 
sometimes you can skew what you believe based on what someone else understands. Unless you truly walk it out for yourself, you may just decide, I'm going to believe what this guy says. I was able to walk out the journey of the children of Israel by watching this documentary that was made by this NASA astronaut scientist guy and a, and a, and a theologian. I walked out and I saw it with my own eyes because they en enabled me to do that and that's the beauty of that story. But not everybody, not everybody has that, that ability but what we've done in the churches and in the congregations throughout the world is we begin to bring in the influences of the world and remember around that mountain, that story of that golden calf, that was the start of allowing the world's influence to come into your faith, into what you are about to see God do, and, and try to subjugate what God's goal is for us. They said, I'm going to bring in the world to, the, to, to, to this, because I don't understand what's going on with God on the top of that mountain. It's flames, it's fires. And imagine if that mountain was totally scorched, I can imagine that they would think, we're not going up there. Remember, they said, we're not going up there lest we die. You go up there, Moshe. I'm not going up there. So you, you have this understanding. So then they, they, he's gone. He's disappeared. They said, well, he must have died or something because he's gone for 40 days. And you think about it. Well, yeah, he's gone for 40 days. It, it, on top of a mountain that was scorched by the fire of God himself, he can't be alive. Let's form our own faith and let's build this calf so that we can worship God upon. Infiltrating the world into now their new faith because of their lack of understanding. Nadav and Avihu, the story in the parasha this week, did the same thing. They brought strange fire with them as they, as they made sacrifice to God. They didn't follow the rules, what was supposed to happen. They were sacrifices themselves because they failed to do what God had called them to do. They, 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 they allowed the world to enter into their faith, and it caused their faith to be tainted. And what God was doing was 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 blurry. There's a lot of things left up to interpretation. What we can't allow, what we can't allow is to say the things that are fact, like the journey of the children of Israel, there's no interpretation there. It's fact. It happened. The things in the scripture that we know are fact, we cannot allow ourselves to be tainted. We have, to, we have to believe them. I was listening to a, a guy this week about an atheist debating a, a believer. And the atheist was talking about how spiritual things cannot affect matter. Right? Things that are spiritual cannot, cannot put pressure upon, cannot affect matter. So the spiritual can't create matter. And then this Christian just completely hands him his lunch. I mean, really does an awesome job. One of the best I've ever heard. Um, in debating an atheist. But the, the point is, is that a lot of people will listen to that science and they'll say to themselves, well, maybe that guy makes a lot of sense, right? Because why? You don't understand the spiritual or you're not engaged in the spiritual enough. So because you're engaged mostly in the, in the material and in, and in the world of the physicality of the world and you're, not, you're less engaged in the spiritual, you, you, you don't understand how the spiritual works. So we can get steered in, in the wrong direction. Here in, I want to talk about, my mom and I were talking about after Pesach, about the spirit of Elijah, Eliyahu. A lot of people don't understand that Pesach, we open the door and we invite the spirit of Eliyahu. A lot of Christians don't get that. They're like, you're allowing, you're inviting spirits in. You know, then it becomes very like, you know, weird and, and they think it's definition. You know, remember when Saul, he, he went on he, and he, uh, he divined to have uh, uh, the prophet Samuel come back. Remember? Samuel comes back to life and he says, why did you disturb my rest? All right. And Saul's like, well, I need answers. 
well, you know, the, 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 the witch that, that, that brought him back, you know, she's like, you made me raise Samuel. Who, you know, oh no. You know, all, all scared and freaked out because it's Samuel the prophet. That divination, you know, was illegal in the spirit then. It's illegal in the spirit today. We're not divining when we ask Eliyahu to come, the spirit of Elijah to come. We're not divining Eliyahu to come. Eliyahu's literally going to come. We're not saying, you know, come spirit of Elijah. We're saying, come Elijah. Yeshua said that John came in the spirit of Eliyahu. John the Immerser. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But the prophets say that Eliyahu will come. So do we believe that Eliyahu will come? Or do we just accept that Yeshua said that John the Immerser came in the spirit of Eliyahu? Which one is it? The spirit or the physical? Which one do we believe? Sometimes it's very hard to believe in the spirit because we're not spiritual. We are physical. I watched a, I watched a YouTube, I sent it to my family, of a, of a lady, I sent it to my friends, of a lady that her arm was just absolutely just a mess. And they're in an African country and they're praying and praying over this woman and this woman's arm literally grows and becomes normal in front of your eyes right there on screen and it was not magic it was not like something they did with a film this was a, a a shady you know motorola camera phone that someone was filming on this thing was real the spiritual touched the physical and that woman's arm became whole just like you did in yeshua's time And you think to yourself, if, if a woman's arm can be, you know, there's no way that's real. Well, then how can people raise from the dead? Yeshua can actually put life back into a body and raise someone from the dead. You can't think that they can't just make his arm normal. It was legit. I've never seen anything like it. I've heard stories, people say things, they say stories, but man, the world nowadays with, with the ability of camera phones and, and social media and all the stuff that we have, well, you can see some things. So the spiritual touched the physical and the spiritual healed the physical. But we have a hard time believing it because we're not spiritual. So can, can the spiritual bring Eliyahu Hanavi back in the physical for sure when we invite the spirit of Eliyahu into the room we're inviting the spirit of repentance we're inviting people to repent to return back let's read Matthew 24 and before we get any deeper into that, because I'll, I'll get way ahead of myself here. But Matthew 24, 26 through 39. Wherefore, if they shall say to you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is, not, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. So they tell you he's in the desert, don't believe it. They tell you he's in the secret chambers, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so shall also the Son of Man be, the coming of the Son of Man be. For whatsoever the carcass is, there will be eagles gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. 
Just FYI, this is a disastrous passage. This is like a scary passage. This is in the book of Matthew, by the way. You're not reading Revelation. You're not reading a prophet. You're reading the words here in the book of Matthew that are telling you what's going to happen in the end, and it's frightening. And, you know, that's the other thing Christians do. Believers. When bad things are happening around the world, they're not praying that God's will be done. They're praying that God stop the bad things. You realize the scriptures say that bad things are coming. You realize without those bad things, the Mashiach doesn't return. So rather than praying against the evils that are coming upon the world when the sun waxes hot and melts the earth below it and say, Lord, stop this from happening, we pray, Lord, your will be done and your son come soon. When the world around us is crumbling, it says it will. Literally, immediately after the tribulation of those days, okay, clearly there will be tribulation. If you believe the Bible, you have to know there's tribulation. The sun will be darkened, frightening. The moon will not give her light, frightening. Okay, the stars shall fall from heaven, more frightening. Meteors everywhere. And the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And, and then shall appear the sign, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, the generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall, shall pass away, but my words shall not pass. But, all, but of the day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That's so key. You know how many people try to interpret that away? Like it, it, here it is. Really, I'm going to say it again. Of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, but my word shall not pass away. Not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. How many people in the world are trying to tell you the day and the hour. Everyone says it. We don't know the time, but we know the season. Everyone says it. There's pastors in the world that legitimately put a date on the calendar. They've destroyed their ministries by putting dates on the calendar, by making themselves look like they are, know the date. I mean, look at, throughout time and history. We've seen it. Only God knows. Only the Father knows. Yeshua's not even saying he knows. The angels don't know. Nobody knows. What we do know is that there will be a sign. And it's near. But we only know that it's near. We don't know the, 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 the time. I mean, okay, okay, we know this. Let's say we know the season. Let's call it, let's call it Rosh Hashanah. Let's call it Rosh Hashanah. Let's say he's coming at Rosh Hashanah. Why? Because that's when a triumphal entry of a king returns. Why? Because that makes a lot of sense that on Rosh Hashanah that the Mashiach would come. Let's call it that. That's the season. So every Rosh Hashanah, we rehearse for the coming of the Mashiach. Every single Rosh Hashanah. But is it Rosh Hashanah? What if in the middle of August, 
the sun grows dark, the moon grows dark, the world starts to shake, the earth and the heavens start to quake, meteors come flying down everywhere, everyone's dying around us, and what if in the middle of August it happens and we see a sign in the sky, whatever that sign may be, maybe it's a cross, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a mug of David, maybe it's, a, maybe it's something else, maybe it's angel wings, whatever the sign may be in the sky, it appears. We don't know when, so stop saying we know when. Just believe. Believe and have faith. The moment you put a date on the calendar, the moment you believe beyond a shot of a doubt, and it doesn't happen when you think it's going to happen, that's when a great falling away comes because your faith is rocked. Because you put all your hope, all your faith, all your dreams into that date and you were anticipating anticipating it's no different from when someone tells you something growing up that you looked up to I'm gonna take you to that ball game you wanted to go to we're gonna go on that ball game on this date and imagine you're a young boy that date comes along and, and your dad or your mentor or whoever it may be comes and says to you sorry we can't go to the ball game we're gonna I gotta work well, all of a sudden, you're rocked. You don't love, you, the way you saw that person is different. I had that experience myself. I was in Israel. I was 14, 15 years old. We were at a big event, a big, in Jerusalem, and we were at a, a big conference, and there was a, a prophet there, Mahesh Chavda, this great prophet of the, of the Christian world, Mahesh Chavda. He was there, he was ministering, and man, he was ministering, and it was amazing. It was just an awesome experience, and there were thousands of people there watching this guy. Thousands, I mean, the, the prime minister shows up at this event where Mahesh Chavda was, and, and, and he comes out to speak. The prime minister of Israel is there. It was just an amazing experience, and, and, and I'm outside in the, in the hallway. Mahesh was over, he was done speaking. I go out in the, in the hallway, and I'm, there's, book, there's, there's tables with books that you can purchase all over in, in, this, in this conference hall. And I'm walking around as this kid and I'm looking through the books. And, and my faith at this time, at this time in my life, was growing. And I was seeking and, and I was looking for God in every way possible. And I was very spiritual at this age. You know, and I got it from you know, watching my mom pray you know, immensely my whole life. And, and, I, and, I, and I was... And I believed in the supernatural in a way that only a kid can believe in the supernatural. I believed in the spiritual at this age in a way that only a kid can believe in the spiritual at this age. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to see this guy, Mahesh Chavda, if I ever would ever see him, that, that I, would, I would go to him and I, would, and I would say, man, I hope to be like you someday. And sure enough, here I am at this table looking at these books and right in front of me on the other side is Mahesh Chavda and I'm like awestruck a prophet of God stands before me what do I do how do I act what do I say so I open my mouth at this man and I start to talk to him and he looks at me and he says, I have no time, kid. No, 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 I can't talk. What just happened? This mighty man of God that thousands of people that I held up at a high esteem because the rest of the world did too just treated me one of the little ones. as common and I felt it deep in my spirit it hit me in a way I can't even describe I felt if you've ever been embarrassed if you've ever felt you've been made low and you want to hang your head and you want to hide in a hole I felt that now any of you guys that know me I don't hide in holes, and I don't hang my head. 
but for a moment, I was made low, and I felt it. And it took me but a moment to say, you could have treated me nicer. I was completely wrecked. He was fake after that to me. In fact, anyone who called themselves a prophet became fake to me. Who are you to call yourself a prophet? Only God can call you a prophet. All of a sudden, my entire perspective on stuff started to change. When other people would say, oh, don't talk to them like that. that. That's a prophet. I would say, that's not a prophet. Only God makes prophets. You can't say that's a prophet. God says he's a prophet. And he wouldn't say he's a prophet if he's a prophet. He would only say the word of God. Walking around with a business card that says prophet on it. There's something wrong with that. My whole perspective shifted after that, and it began to define how I think. Right or wrong, it's what happens. So you have to get back into the spiritual because the physical rocks you. You have to be focused on what God is trying to do because what's going on around you will confuse you. What people are telling you is real versus what God says is will rock you and you have to be grounded in the spirit and the physical to really be walking in the kingdom, walking where God wants us to be. But here we are, this scary, scary time that only God knows, no one else knows, all the prophets in the world that say, when God's coming, uh, the Bible literally says that no one will know. So I don't know why you're telling me that you know when the Bible literally says you won't know. Stop telling me you know when the end is. It's been the end for the last, I'm, I'm only 40, I'll be 42 this month. I'm only 42 years old, but every single year of my life has been the end. It's the final year. It's the final countdown, I mean, the entire thing, every, my whole life. Is it? What I can tell you is, the end is coming. Why do I know that? The Bible says it. What I can tell you is that there are signs around us that tell you that the world is in birthing pains. And we see those. So we believe them, because the Bible says it. What I can tell you is that the world is getting, becoming increasingly evil compared to what we've known in the last couple hundred years. Okay? Not compared to what we've known in the last thousand years. They used to toss children out into fields to Moloch, and they used to let animals ravage them and kill them and rip them apart. It's the same thing as abortion. Okay? It's not any necessarily different than what humankind was. Imagine the hordes in Rome. Imagine, imagine the Colosseums. Is it much different from UFC today? Is it much different from what the world sees and enjoys today? It's the Colosseums. It's Rome. We're the same. But the spiritual world is changing. And if you don't recognize what's happening in the spirit, you can't possibly see and understand the movement in the physical. So you have to live in the spirit to understand what's happening in the physical. Because I can literally point back to history and time and tell you that everything happening today has happened in the past. It's no different. It's only different in the space and time that I live. I can't go, I can't send my kids out on the street to, uh, to play until the street lights come on, like I did. I can't do that now, because the world has changed. 
in my space and time. As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Listen, what does that say? That tells you that the world will be normal. And then a great destruction. We're still eating and drinking. We're still marrying and giving in marriage. Sure, around the world there's a lot of that not happening. Sure, always has been that way. How was I so lucky to be born here in Akron, Ohio? In a great family that treated me well, that raised me right, that fed me every single day, that put clothes on my back, and I walked around in Jordans as a kid. How was I so lucky? That I wasn't born in the Sudan. That I wasn't born in a, in a Bedouin society where I've never seen modern technology. Today, that still exists. It still exists. Luck of the draw, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why I was chose for what I have and they were chose for what they have and they'll never see it the way I see it and I'll never see it the way they do. I don't know. Are we special, those of us that are here? I don't know. What I can tell you is that there will always be, no matter what community, no matter what place in the world, no matter if you have nothing, no matter if you have everything, there will always be people eating and drinking and giving in marriage. And one day, the world will just stop in a different way. <clears throat> and they'll know not until the flood count comes and takes them all away. So also, so also shall the... Su so the coming of the Son of Man be. We are all witnesses of the great beginning of this prophetic word given by Yeshua himself. We're witnesses of it. So we have to take a journey in the Spirit when we read his words, and we have to, 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 to think about how this all looks through the eyes of God, through the spiritual, even through the prophets. Let's take Ezekiel, for example. We just had Pesach. We just went through the Passover. And that's a very that's a very spiritual time for all of us, the Passover. It actually feels like the most significant time to us. Because it represents the death and resurrection of Yeshua much like maybe Easter is to Christianity. But we see things a little bit different. We fast at that, that time for, for, that, for that week. We fast from normal food, then we eat matzah. And every time we eat matzah and every day we wake up and we don't have bread or we don't have the normal stuff, pantry's always bare, looking inside the pantry and I'm looking through it. There's nothing in it. And I'm like, how many macaroons can I eat? But you're starving, you're starving your, your physical body from what it wants and desires to take what God requires for that period of time so that what? So that you can reflect upon who you are, see what God wants from you in the spiritual. We take our own spiritual walk, our own spiritual journey, into the holy place of God through prayer. And we walk through the doors of the temple that God places before us, allowing, allowing him to show us the abomination of the faith. At that time during Pesach, there's many abominable things happening in the faith. And I'm talking about the whole faith. This year, interestingly, you had Ramadan, you had Pesach, you had Easter all at the same time. Easter is, is, is wrought with, with abominable things against God. Easter egg hunts and the whole thing that you go through with the kids and, the, and, the, and the, all the stuff that 
that goes along with Easter, aside from the fact that Christianity, I was talking to somebody this during that time, did you have a nice holiday? And they said, oh yeah, Easter's always great, we get together, we have dinner, we take the kids here and do Easter egg hunts, we do this and do that. And, and I'm like, okay, I'm like, does Easter have anything to do with Jesus in your family? And that was my question. Does, does it have anything to do with Jesus? Since that, like, literally is the reason for the holiday? Not really, no, we don't go to church, we just do the whole stuff, all the stuff around it. I mean, how, in, how on the planet can you have a holiday that's rooted in Jesus and in God, and at the same time, you don't even have to celebrate what the meaning of it is because there's all kinds of other stuff to do. You can't have a Passover, keep the Passover, without having God be the center of it. You can't just have a Seder without recognizing the, the, the reason for the Seder. But for some reason, you can have Easter without recognizing the reason for Easter. What does that mean? It means that the world has infiltrated the faith. And we've allowed it. Churches have Easter bunnies hopping through their foyers. They pass out Easter baskets to all their children. Literally, churches have an Easter bunny sitting in a chair, and they're, and, and, and they're taking pictures on Sunday morning, on Easter morning, pictures with the Easter bunny on Sunday morning. What happened? Tell me this is not Nadav and Avihu. Tell me this is not the, the, the golden calf at the foot of the mountain. What did Ezekiel do? What did Ezekiel do? He peered through the hole in the wall of the temple and he saw what? Women weeping for Tammuz. Tell me this is not different from what we're experiencing today. It's the same. We're peering through a hole in a wall, and we're watching. I, I, this is legit. If you look up at 30,000 feet, and you look down upon the church, you're going to look at them and think, oh, they're worshiping God. But then if you are like Ezekiel, and you come down from 30,000 feet, and you zero in, in that hole in the wall, and you just look at that little place, you will find a child sitting on the lap of an Easter bunny in the middle of a church, and you won't even know that they're in the middle of a church. You'll have no idea where they're at. You're just, oh, look, they're sitting on Easter bunny. Oh, look, they're passing out Easter baskets. And then if you go like this and you look at it, you think to yourself, wait a minute, that's Easter Sunday. That's not the mall. That's a church where you elevate Yeshua. There's a problem with it. No matter what anyone tells you, there's a problem with it. It's wrong. It's an abomination. It's abominable. Elders and leaders of congregations are facing toward the east, worshiping the sun, and they don't even know it. You'll identify that the walls and the foundations of the spiritual temples of today's church, they've been fortified by every creeping thing and abomination to God. In the ways of the righteous <coughs> have become evil through their lack of understanding and the misguidance of the leaders over the flocks. The church today is not built upon the truth of God's word, and thus he's sending the spirit of Eliyahu to prepare the people for his swift coming. He's sending his spirit of Eliyahu, his spirit of repentance. When the children of Israel were at the foot of the mountain of Har Sinai, and I love that I saw this documentary because now every time I say Har Sinai, I see it. You gotta watch it. Every time I say the children of Israel were at the foot of the mountain, 
I see where they were. Man, it was awesome. You got to watch it. But here, imagine after 40 days, what happens when your leader's gone? What happens when the leader's gone? The people begin to run the roost. The inmates run the asylum. They decide to do what they want to do and what makes sense to them. This is what's happening. Moses was gone. He was away with God in the spiritual. And here they are in the physical. They're focused on eating and drinking and sleeping and giving in marriage. And what do we do with our children? Moses is alone. Zipporah is gone down there with them. He's by himself with him and God in the spiritual. He's getting instruction. Everyone else is down at the foot of the mountain, and they can't help but think, well, we've got to eat. Well, we've got to feed our children. What are we going to drink for water? They're focusing on today. He doesn't even care about today because he's in heaven. He's literally in heaven. The 40 days he was with God, he was in heaven. He did not care one bit about the physical. He probably he went the whole time without eating. Don't need to eat. I'm standing here with the Creator. Here he is in heaven. He's not even thinking about it. So what happens when they're in the spiritual and you're too spiritual and you can't lead them? God says to him, Moshe, those people you brought here, they're worshiping other gods. No. No. I hear war down there. There's a war. <laughs> There's no war. These are your people. They're, God says they're not mine. Moshe had to fight for, for that, for, for the people, right? He, but he had to come back down and provide leadership. What has happened over the course of the last 2,000 years in the, in, the, in the faith is the leadership has died. And so now all of a sudden, we're allowing the world to make golden calves in our faith. We're allowing the world to bring the golden calf at the foothills of God's mountain. <coughs> People pray all the time. Lord, bring me to your mountain. Let me feast at your banqueting table. They'll pray it. And meanwhile, they're done worshiping. All right, kids, let's go sit on Santa's lap in the middle of church. Is there anything wrong with Santa? Not innately. No, there's nothing necessarily wrong with the idea of a man who gives It becomes an idol, and that idol is what becomes wicked. It becomes a requirement, and that requirement is what becomes wicked. It becomes more important than the requirement that God puts in front of you. That requirement you create becomes more important than God's requirements, and therefore you become unholy before God himself because you're not following his holiness. You're following your Shabbat. You're following your new moon. You're following your Sabbath day and feasts. No longer God's. In Judaism, it's discussed that before the coming of Mashiach ben David, Eliyahu the Tishbite will return to the earth as a witness, proclaiming the way of the Lord, commanding repentance of the children of Israel. Throughout the rest of this world, we will be discussing uh, Eliyahu, the spirit of Eliyahu, that is pouring onto the earth and preparing the scattered children of Israel. You guys might get scared. I'm going to stop early. You know, when I said throughout the rest of this, that was just in this seat. I'm only on page one there. There's eight pages. We're not going through it. But, but Malachi chapter 4, 1 through 5, it says, For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. 
but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall and ye shall tread down the wicked and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this says the Lord of hosts remember ye the law of Moshe my servant which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all of Israel with the statutes and the judgments behold I will send you Eliyahu Hanavi before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Listen, Yeshua came in the Spirit. <coughs> There's two Messiahs. Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef. Mashiach ben Yosef came for the Spirit. to save the spirit. And he accomplished his, 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 his goal through his death and his resurrection. But if Mashiach ben David requires Eliyahu the Tishbite to come in the physical, Mashiach ben Yosef must also require Eliyahu the Navi to come in the spiritual. The physical will mirror the spiritual. The spiritual was first, the physical is next. Guess who came in the spirit? Of Eliyahu Anavi. Yochanan the Immerser. John the Baptist. Yeshua said it. He was very plain about it. But when he comes, this is Malachi. Behold, I will send you Eliyahu Anavi before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Have we had that yet? Someone tell me, have we had the great, dreadful day of the Lord yet? No, no, we haven't. We haven't even come close to that yet. That's judgment. The great and dreadful day of the Lord is Judgment Day. And we haven't had that yet. Christianity likes to tell you we have. We've all been judged and we've all been freed. Well, then you might as well scratch tribulation off the, off the table because that's not going to happen because everybody's already been judged. We've not been judged yet. We are being judged for everything, for every action that we have will come before God, before his sight. Everything will be judged, and that's something we cannot fight. These are scriptures that are very hard to read, and there's mostly they're scriptures that people stay away from in the churches today. Why? Because they're hard to read. They make you reflect. They make you inflect upon who you are and the sin which is rampant and the wickedness which is rampant in our faith. And it makes you question the abominations you have allowed into your own faith. They're difficult to read. John the Immerser came in the spirit of Eliyahu. Eliyahu Hanavi, I believe, before Mashiach ben David returns, is coming again. I think that. Why? It says it in Malachi. Malachi sent by God, prophesied to us, uh, telling us in verse 4, God requires us to remember the laws of Moshe, which were given to him at Horeb. He then follows with God's promise to send Eliyahu the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the day of judgment that's facing the earth. I've had debates with pastors a million times that you need to see that as a spiritual understanding. Okay, that it happened already in, in, in John the Immerser and it happened with Jesus and it's done. No, no, no. Jesus is coming again. Yeshua HaMashiach, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you don't believe that he's coming again as a, as a Melech David and establishing a throne in Israel, then yeah, I accept your position. But if you believe that it's not done, 
His mission is not complete. That he said, I will return when my father tells me to. Because only my father knows. If you believe, his return is going to be immense and, and, and immeasurable to the point where he steps upon the mountain of olives. It cracks it in half. When he speaks out of his mouth comes a sword. His eyes are fiery red. His hair is long and flowing and white. And on his thigh it says king of kings and lord of lords. And the world bows to him. And all the world mourns when they see the sign in the sky when he's returning. And why do they mourn? Because they rejected him. Because they rejected who he was. And they rejected the laws of Moshe. The laws that he commanded us to follow. Matthew 17, verse 9, And as they came down from the mountain, Yeshua charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. His disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Eliyahu must first come? Same question that we all have. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It says in the, in the prof, prophets, in the, in the Nevi'im, Eliyahu must first come. If you believe what you're reading, you have, to, you have to see it come to fruition. It's the same story I told you about Mahesh Chand. It's the same story I told you about that a man who says, you come to the ball game with me. No, I have to go to work. It's the same thing. I read it, I believed it, and all of a sudden you're making it false. He says, they say, wait a minute. Eliyahu has to come. And Yeshua answered and said to them, Eliyahu truly has first come to restore all things. But I say to you that Eliyahu has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake to them as of John the Immerser. Now, the Yahweh had to come before this Mashiach ben Yosef, and so he did in the spirit through John the Immerser. But I believe that when Yeshua returns in the physical as the king, I think Eliyahu Hanavi is coming. Has to. I'll have the same question for Yeshua if he returns again without Eliyahu. Again, I'll have the same question these disciples had. I'll say, well, Yeshua, I thought the scribe says Elias must first come. And then he'd have to have an answer like this. Well, he surely did come. They didn't see him. They rejected him. The angel Gabriel says in Zech to Zach Zacharias in Luke chapter 1 that John the Baptist was sent in the spirit and the power of the Lord. That's the key. He was sent in the spirit and the power of the Lord to proclaim repentance to the children, turning their hearts back to the fathers, and vice versa. He was baptizing people that had transgressed what? The laws of Moshe. That's what he was doing. You know, John the Baptist wasn't converting people to Christianity. You realize that Christianity didn't exist when John the Baptist was in ministry. Yeshua was walking around the earth at the same time, doing his thing. And John the, John the Baptist had his own ministry. What was he converting them to? He was taking Jewish people, the people of Israel, that had failed to follow God's commands and making them holy through mikvah and tshuva, repentance. To what? The laws of Moshe. Turning their hearts back to the laws of Moshe. That's what John the Baptist was doing. The whole church has it, has, you know, they think literally, you could go to a church today, I, I challenge you now to go to a church today and they will literally believe that John the Baptist was baptizing people into Christianity. Well, he was baptizing them into Christianity. What else? No, he baptized them, mikvahed them, for tshuva, 
to do what? To bring them back to the laws of Moshe, to repent, to bring their hearts back to the Father where they belong. That was the whole purpose. That was all in the Spirit being done prior to Yeshua's return to get the hearts right so that, so that Yeshua, when their hearts are right, they can recognize Yeshua. You understand that's the whole point, right? You understand that if Eliyahu doesn't show up to get the hearts of the people right, to see the laws of Moses, that when the Mashiach actually comes, you won't recognize that he is the fulfillment of the laws of Moses. So you have to get everyone to repent, to come back to the laws of Moses, understand them, live by them, so that when they see the Messiah, they recognize him. That's the whole purpose of Eliyahu. Is the church going to recognize Mashiach? You've got to repent and get back into the laws of Moshe to understand who he is, because that's where he's the scribe. That's where he's explained, so we have to get a spirit of repentance away from that which is abominable, away from that which is sinful, away from that which is wicked, and allowing the stuff like Nadav and Avihu, allowing our churches and congregations to build what? Golden calves before God at the Mount of Horeb, because leadership has died. And the point is here that the leadership rests in the hands of the Kohen, the priests, who did what? Followed the commands of God. It is high time that we as Messianic believers share the truth with those who say they're followers of our Mashiach. If you are a follower, then you need to look like him. Walk like him. Act like him. Live his life. Imagine Yeshua on Easter in the middle of a church taking a selfie with the Easter bunny and a baby in his lap. Would it happen? I can almost promise you that that pastor would, would, would run that bunny out of, the, out of the congregation. We are in an interesting time. We are in a time of Nadav and Avihu bringing strange fire and sacrifice to God. We are in a time of the golden calf standing at the foothills of, of, of Har Sinai. While God is on the, on the mountain in the spiritual, burning it and setting it aflame, doing what? Giving Moshe guidance and direction and commandments so that we might follow them and do what? Get closer to him and do what? Be in his presence and do what? Make an abode for him on earth. That's the whole purpose. And as we make an abode for him here on earth, when he returns, he's returning to his home, which we have created. A beautiful place that worships him, adores him, and humbly accepts the love which he's given us and the grace that he pours upon us. Amen. It is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe... Greatness to the altar of creation, for he made us unlike the nations of the lands, and has not placed us like the families of the earth. He's not made our portion like theirs, and our lot like all their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow, and acknowledge our thanks before the King of kings, the Holy One, blessed is he. He stretches out heaven and establishes the earth's foundations, and the seat of his glory is in the heavens above, and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He's our God, there's none other. True is our King, there's nothing beside him. As it is written in his Torah, you shall know this day, Take to your heart that the Lord, he is God, in the heavens above and on the earth below, there is none other. Amen, amen. Let's stand again.
you satisfy. I am empty, but I know your love does not run dry. So I wait for you, Lord. So I wait for you. I'm falling on my knees. My Referring all of me, yes, you were your own. This heart is living for broken. I run to you for your arms are open wide. I am weary, but I know your touch restores my life. And so I wait for you, Lord. Yes, I wait for you. I'm falling on my knees, offering all of me.
Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the living God. Oh, Spirit of the Living Lord, come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the living God. And let the weight of your glory cover us. And let the life of your river flow. Let the truth of your kingdom reign in us. Let the weight Shabbat, where your presence has fallen down upon us, Lord. We just thank you and praise you today for everything that you do for us and you take care of us. For being there for us. You are so great and awesome and powerful, Lord. I just pray that you would be with us this week as we leave this place, Lord, that every day that you would be the center of our hearts, the center of our attention, Lord, and that we would continue to praise you and seek you, Lord. 
that your presence would follow us and continue to be with us. We thank you for your forgiveness, Lord, even though we don't deserve it. We just thank you and praise you today in Yeshua's name. Just for a couple announcements, we do have Yeshiva and youth group this Wednesday night, 7.30 to 9. In Yeshiva, we're going to be talking about the sin cycle and judges period. Uh, again, uh, 7.30 to 9 p.m. this Wednesday, and then youth group as well, uh, 7.30 to 9. Uh, that's all we really have today. So just a reminder, there's a docket box in the backs for tithes, offerings, donations. Alongside here to the left is your praise reports and prayer requests. As we go into Oneg, let's say the bracha together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lech min haaretz ba Hashem Yeshua Hamashiach Amen Shavuot Tov.